Good afternoon, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank you, the organizers, for inviting me and Grand Challenges for helping me to be here. Um, it is a pleasure to be in this celebration for King's work. But before I start, um, I have to say that I'm kind of like the only one from Latin America that represents uh, the lots of things that King has done in, in this area in the area of STDs and in the area of Latin America. So um, I would like to show, because everybody would like, I mean, everybody wanted to come King, I have to tell you, but uh, it's not always easy. So everybody wanted to say something and want to congratulate you for this award, please. The inspiring story of King's work in Peru goes back to the year 1990 when he receives his first Peruvian fellow Jorge Sanchez. The story has continued since. Through the years, King recruited more and more young Peruvians, giving them the opportunity to get different levels of training in STDs, HIV, research, laboratory, informatics and global health, working in different institutions and from different regions in Peru. He has created a critical mass of researchers and leaders in HIV and STD research for Latin America. Congratulations to the men who shaped my professional career. Thank you, King. Congratulations, King. Thanks for helping the world to be a better place. And thanks for helping us to be better people. Felicitaciones. Peruvians love you. You are our father. King, congratulations. You gave me this tie and a lot of knowledge. Thank you. King, thinking again and again, who could deserve an award like this? I can only think of you. Congratulations on this wonderful recognition of your work. King, you are always destined to be a king. Uh, many congratulations, King. I'm very sure this is a very well-deserved uh, recognition for all your great work, uh, mentoring students, helping a lot of people. Well-deserved award. You rule, King. Congratulations, you are the king. Viva King! Viva! Viva! Really, thank you very much, King, from all of us. And now, I hope those minutes didn't count. And um, <laughs> what I will do is I will um, talk a little bit about one of the big projects that we have been working. Several people work on this project together with King. The Pre Peru Prevent, and Prevent means prevention in Spanish, without the T, Prevent Trial. This was a randomized control trial targeting high risk and general population to control curable STIs. First of all, I have to present you Peru. We're in the south, in the middle of Latin America, and my country, although it's a small country, is a very warm country, and uh, it looks a little bit like a seahorse, as you can see there. So, everything started to, um, a long time ago, when people were saying that there were no STDs in Peru, until um, one of the first fellows, who was Jorge Sanchez, um, got some information about the opposite. There were STIs in Peru, that was the first study, and then we learned also that even in the jungle, in the Andes, and in those areas where we have rural populations, STIs were pretty common. The other thing that we learned is that although there were services for female sex workers, those services were doing nothing mainly. But if you improve a little bit the services, you could really make a difference. The other thing that we learned is that we thought that there were no STIs because people was not going to the clinics. They were going to other places that are much easier and where people will treat you better, that are the pharmacies. The pharmacies and the boticas. The boticas are like little shops that you can open just with the signature of the pharmacist. So we work a lot, and those were the first studies that we did, and we proved that people was going there, that physicians were treating almost the same as the pharmacies, all STIs, because pharmacists will learn from re prescriptions of the physicians. And the other thing that we learned was that the prevalences of STIs were 
of people going to pharmacies were as high as the prevalence of anybody going to any STI clinic. So we learned that there were STIs, and this was happening not only in Peru, but in other parts of Latin America, and that there was a need of doing interventions for sexually transmitted infections. There were lots of studies being done in Africa, but mainly in rural areas, but there were no previous interventions that have taken place in urban areas, none in Latin America, none in Peru, where STIs and HIV were existing. I mean, we proved that they were there. There were no multi-components or complex STIs uh, preventions, interventions, um, and there was no thought about uh, targeting both general population and high-risk groups. And that's how the idea started. The idea of doing an urban community randomized controlled trial of a multi-component complex prevention intervention with these four components. Number one, trying to create a mobile team to reach the hard to reach female sex workers, giving them treatment and promotion and provision of condoms. The second was trying to work with the pharmacies, but also creating a network with the clinicians and the midwives. We have professional midwives that will see any type of reproductive problem. The third was trying to work with social marketing of condoms and prevent and treatment packages, just to be sure that we had the medications where they were needed. And the fourth component was to work on health communication campaign, recognition of STI symptoms and early health seeking behavior. And that's how the PREVENT study was born. And you, as you can see there, if you notice, these are little men and women holding their hands all together. And that was part of our PREVENT signature, because this was the logo that we used, that meant prevention, that had the Andean colors, and that had men and women working together. Our aims were to evaluate the impact of this multi-component compl complex intervention on the prevalence on the two groups, one general population and the other one female sex workers, and to do it in urban Peru. This is the study design. We were very ambitious and we decided to have a randomized controlled trial with two big arms, an intervention arm with the four components and a control arm with the status quo. 10 cities in one and 10 cities in the other. In Peru, we have 24 big cities. So we chose 20 of the cities for this trial. And the idea was to measure the outcomes through general population surveys, and the second through female sex worker surveys. Let me show you, this is Peru. And as you can see, the trial was all over the country. In red dots, the intervention cities, and in blue dots, the control cities. And that's how it started. So let me tell you a little bit about the prevention interventions that were those several. First, the female sex worker mobile team intervention. So mainly what we started to do was to map the commercial sex venues. And we learned that there were several types of bars, like this bar called Life is Worth Nothing, video pubs, streets, or places like this in the middle of the jungle where commercial sex work happened just over a plastic bag. So initially, we were thinking about having mobile teams with cars or maybe trucks, but that was impossible and was not going to be sustainable. So the, we evolved the idea into having this mobile team of people, mainly a health worker and a peer female sex worker that will go and will visit each of these sex venues in each of the 10 cities every eight weeks, offering presumptive treatment for vaginal infections with metronidazole, um, collecting swaps, self-obtained uh, vaginal swaps to do PCR for GC and chlamydia and trichomonas, giving counseling and promotion of condoms, and promoting the services of the Ministry of Health too. The tests were sent centrally for processing. The results were back through internet. And then these sex venues were visited again, and women that needed treatment for chlamydia or for gonorrhea will receive the treatment in one week. And we call this a cycle, a cycle that was repeated every two months. So let me show you a little bit some of the results. Uh, we were able to complete 20 cycles of two months during the study, and we were reaching around 2,500 uh, women in each cycle. Uh, we had lots of new participants, and that allowed us to understand a little bit better the market of commercial sex. There were lots of women that were coming each time, which make it more challenging to work with uh, female sex workers. We were able to drop 
the chlamydia prevalence by cycle, but when we did a restricted analysis only for women that were visited several times, what you can see is that the drop in prevalence was much higher um, for trichomonas and for uh, chlamydia, both of them. But one of the things that we learned also is that in the same commercial venues where we, we were able to find men, men that were working also in commercial sex. And actually, they began to request services. This was not part, this was not anticipated and was not part of the trial. But actually, we were able to complete five cycles, offering services, again, with a mobile team that was a, a health worker and a male sex worker educator. We offered syphilis and HIV and screening and STI screening condoms, and we were able to give more than 3,000 counseling sessions, and a lot of condoms were distributed. One of the things that we learned with this population is that the rates of syphilis and HIV were pretty high. They were higher in certain areas, especially in the jungle. And we kind of like modeled the impact at the population level. Only in the five cycles, we estimated that there were, there were at least 60,000 clients that were exposed to HIV and syphilis. And then in a way we could have prevent um, giving the treatment with this mobile team. The second intervention was the Red Preven, which means the Preven Network. And you can see here in the bottom um, a pharmacy that has all these signs about how they know about STDs, which was a new thing. So in this Preven Network, our objective was, number one, identify pharmacies, train them. Second, identify physicians, clinicians, midwives, train them, and then put them together to work. So what we did is we learned from the drug from the companies that sell drugs, medications, because they always visit the pharmacies and the doctors, and they train them when they visit them. So we created these 90-minute prevention seminars at lunchtime for pharmacy and botica workers. Um, we train them, we have this role playing, and eventually we evaluate them as in the Olympics and certificate them as knowing how to and recognize and manage STIs. For the physicians and the midwives, we create workshops and self-instructed manuals. And eventually, all of them became this Preven network, oops, this Preven network that you see there, that was launched in 2004. And they were, visit, they were visited by the prevention salespersons that were midwives that work with us, and they were giving educational materials and were collecting information about new cases and discussing cases with them. So we trained more than 700 pharmacies and boticas, which represented 95% of all the pharmacies and boticas in these 10 cities. We trained more than 2,000 workers in pharmacies and boticas, and a lot of physicians and midwives. And they all received educational materials and merchandising. There you can see this happy smiley face that is a condom that said, here we know about STDs. And that was one of the signs what, that you could use to recognize the places. We evaluated the training using simulated patients. We used lots of people looking, acting like they were having an STI. In red, you can see what happened with the control pharmacies. In blue, with the uh, intervention pharmacies. And what you can see is that they learn how to manage vagin urethral discharge and vaginal discharge. Actually, all the syndromes. The third intervention had to do with the social marketing prevention of campaign. Mainly what we did is we promote the use of condoms, but we learned two things from the formative research. Number one is that people were thinking that, they were thinking that condoms were bore, boring, boring, and they were too expensive when you had to buy packets of three if they were going to use one. So the social marketing campaign brought this idea of having a condom that was new, it was going to be okay, okay condom, okay? And the other thing is that it was supposed to be sold as one condom, that's why you see one box. And the other thing, we brought new ideas. And what you see there, it doesn't have words. That condom is having nails, that's what I was told. And it's supposed to be more sensitive. At least that's what the marketing campaign said, and they love it. So, and we have the other condom that was new also, is the chocolate flavor condom. And so we brought the, the condom with the nails and the chocolate, the chocolate flavor condom that were very popular. I like chocolate. Everybody likes chocolate, right? <laughs> anyway, so we have this campaign, and because we got money from USAID, and that was the deal, but it was a great idea. We, for the first time, we have a condom that was promoted um, for two things, to prevent unwanted pregnancies and for prevention of STIs. 
So that was the idea. And the other thing to make easier, and this is something that we heard from the professionals, it is so difficult to remember how to treat STIs. Okay, so let's make easy packages. So we created the packages, two packages for STIs. Four tablets of metronidazole for vaginal discharge, and then the two acetro plus cipro for urethral discharge. Effective pack and effective plus. Plus in English, but in English, Spanish is effective plus, okay? So it was easier for them to understand the colors and treat. Um, so that was the social marketing campaign, and it was very effective. I think King already mentioned that we proved that people use more condoms. And actually, I started receiving phone calls from other condom companies because they wanted they wanted uh, us to take care of their marketing because it was, I mean, they noticed that in our cities there was a lot of condoms sold. The fourth campaign was the health communications campaign that had two main objectives. Number one, help the population to recognize what an STI was. And then, like in this case, a woman, if you have abnormal vaginal discharge and explains what it is, it can be an STI. So what should I do? The second message, where should I go? Let's go to a prevent network, clinic or pharmacy. And so we had key messages for STI recognition. This is the case of the young man. If you have passed through your penis, that is an STI. And it was very well taken. And it, people had lots of questions. And we create this brochure that was called the ABC of the STDs that have all the questions that people was asking and they wanted answers. And we have an ABC of the condom too. We use local media because we were trying to avoid contamination. That's, that was the only reason. It was more time consuming, but it worked. And we use printed materials. And we were everywhere, in local radios, in town squares, in bars, in disco, in soccer games, okay? Because people was there, beauty parlors and internet booths, and all our campaign was all over the cities. And one of the things, just to show you, is that we were able, and we measured this through a survey, we were able to prove that in comparing intervention to control cities, there was a difference on the recognition and symptoms. And people started to talk about sexually transmitted infections. So those were the four interventions, but how did we measure them? It was a real challenge because initially the study was designed to use military recruits and antenatal care. But during the study, the government decided not to have any more military recruits, so we have to change, and we decided to do the most challenging thing. It was King's idea, I have to say, and it was so difficult, but we did it. And so we started thinking about doing population-based surveys, door by door, asking people questions about sexual behavior and collecting samples. So I bet King that no Peruvian women will like to give a self-obtained vaginal swab, and actually I lost. Women won it, and you will see that the participation rates were really high. So we did, you can see there the, the women knocking the door with this big bag. We were knocking doors and trying to find men and women 18 to 29 years old. They were giving informed consents, and we have a survey that was a demographic survey, a sex behavior survey that was self-applied, and we collected the specimens, urine and blood from men, um, and blood from women, and self-obtained vaginal swaps uh, for women. And this was what was inside the bag. So actually they were carrying lots of things and they were going door by door collecting information and samples. All of them were midwives or doctors, all of them with white coats, and all of them uh, saying that they were coming from the universidad. And actually they were very well received in the houses. In 2002 we used paper formats, but. As time goes on, we started using uh, personal digital assistants. There were no cell phones, really smartphones at that time, but they were very well taken and they were hide. You can see there how we hide the PDA and um, young people love to give answers in those PDAs because that was the opportunity for them to try them. For the female sex workers, uh, we did census and initially we had a convenient sampling time location sampling, they give informed consent, and we have a demographic and a sex behavior cons a, a survey, and we collected also specimens in each of the places for female sex workers. All the results of the tests were given to the participants, but for that, we gave them little cards with codes, and they had to go to the local Ministry of Health STD clinic, and the idea was to try to link them to the services. And um, in the case of the female sex workers, we were giving them the results back in the in the um, sex venues, but we were also sending them to the Ministry of Health uh, Services for treatment. 
So you can see there, the participation the participation rates were very, very high. And, uh, and people was calling us to the office from different cities asking about prevent, about the PREVENT study and not asking also about STDs. So it was very positive. So finally, let's go into the trial results. We had results for female sex workers, for general population of women, and for general population of men. So as I mentioned, our outcome was to find out what happened with the combined STIs and with individuals, that was our primary, and with individual STIs. And what we proved here, and we compared the overall prevalence in the control cities and the intervention cities. And um, so our relative risk was 0 0.66, which means, and this is the best, the best way to see it, we were able to reduce the prevalence of combined STIs in 34% in female sex workers. And if you look, we were able also to reduce the prevalence for chlamydia and trichomonas. The hysteria gonorrhea will have very, very few cases, really. I just want to show you the trends. So these were the several, the different surveys that we have, and you can see that the trends show that in combined STIs we drop um, STIs in the intervention cities. Here is for trichomona, which is really very, very marked, the drop in female sex workers. And just to show them, show you, although HIV was not our outcome, and it's not significantly different, we were able also to decrease at least the trends on HIV in female sex workers. For the general population of women, again, looking at the combine, we can see that the relative risk is 0 0.77, which means that we were able to reduce the prevalence of combined STIs, 23% in general population in women. Um, also for chlamydia and also for trichomonas. But one of the things that we didn't see was any significant changes for men. So this is the data for men. We didn't see any significant difference. So there were lots just to wrap up, there were lots of things that we learned with this study. And actually we're still, and we were discussing with Kim that we still need to analyze some more data still. First, one of the key issues to develop a big study like this is to have a detailed planning and involvement of all the authorities and the community. And actually we have a very important participation even of volunteers in the cities. Formative research was quite important because we learned what people needed and that's what we gave them. Um, it is feasible to run general population surveys. We have high participation rates, more than 90%, as I show you. And it's feasible to develop and implement community randomized trials in Peru. The intervention worked, and it worked definitely, but we need to explore why not in men and what else can be done. And actually, one area that we want to work closely, it's uh, the group of male sex workers that right now is not receiving any services directly from the Ministry of Health. The Peru Prevent Intervention uh, was effective, as I show you, with a reduction of 34% of combined STIs in female sex workers and 23% in women. The question is, would it be possible to scale up this study? Well, actually, it was born scaled up because it was in the whole country. So um, the answer is yes. What about the costs? What about the, the uh, CE analysis? The intervention cost about $5,000 per C per city per month, which is much, much less than the budget that the government is now spending in interventions that don't work. Um, some of the conclusions that we have, it is not enough to prove something work. It is necessary to help understand what it means and help in the implementation and offer coaching and identify champions. And all these things take time. And I'm saying this because all these years, although we work with the Ministry of Health, we have been working together to try to see how to implement this at the level of the country. All these activities are already in the plan, in the national planning, but several of them were not really taken to action. So now we're working again with the Peruvian uh, Ministry of Health and we're discussing the activities, the training, the monitoring and the follow-up that we will start in 2004, 2014 to make prevent a national prevent. Even with the authorities that had to do with the pharmacies, finally they understood that pharmacies are there and pharmacies are playing a role that we cannot ignore. And the other thing is this issue of program science that you will I heard later from uh, Jamie Blanchard. So we want to work together, so not only to implement, but to follow and monitoring. And we're also sharing the experience with other Latin American countries. 
Um, we wrote this, and you can find it in the website. It's in English and in Spanish. And actually, it's not really meant to be a scientific document. We are writing all the publications, but this is more like what are the lessons and how to do, even how to do mapping in commercial sex. All the kind of things that we would have liked to know, but we learned uh, while we were doing the study. Um, a big project has to include lots of people, all the people that work with us. And again, Preven, all together, and thank you very much, King, for the wonderful experience and for shaping my career. I never thought about working on STDs. Uh, just the word sex will make my, my cheeks flush. And so when I say that I'm working on sexually transmitted diseases or I work on things related to sex, I always remember King. Um, so it's amazing, and you can change, you have changed my life, King. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you.